Evening all, hello and welcome. We're in Cranes and Colitis UK Central Headquarters in St Albans. Um, I'm Isabel Mason, I'm a nurse consultant in gastroenterology and I work temporarily part-time here at the charity leading our IBD nurse specialist campaign. But we're here this evening to talk about travel and IBD. Do you want to introduce yourself Kay? So my name is Kay Griefson, I'm a lead IBD nurse at the Royal Free Hospital in London and I developed IBD Passport which is a website for people travelling with IBD. So IBD Passport Kay is what a particular website that you can go to what to find out information or? Yeah, yeah so it's a website and um, the link for anyone who's interested is um, www.ibdpassport.com and it essentially was founded um, by myself and I've now got another team on board as well. And it's information for people who are travelling with IBD. So it's got everything that you need to know on one website. Um, it's got resources that link to other important information that you might want to know. And it's just kind of a one-stop shop really for people who are travelling and need some advice. Excellent. So we've got double expertise here, haven't we? <laughs> we've got your nurse specialist skills and your travel, travel expertise. Yes. With that in mind, if you had to give a top line message, you know, what's your big message that you'd like to get over to everyone who's listening tonight, or they will answer their questions too, what would that message be? I'd say the main message is having IBD shouldn't stop you from travelling and experiencing all the things that you may have wanted to do before you were diagnosed. That you maybe just need to plan a little bit more ahead and um, take some certain things into consideration before you do travel, whether that's in the UK or whether you travel abroad. But that's the main thing really, that IBD shouldn't limit you. The thing is that we, we did some surveys here with supporters and we know that it does yes. and we know that there are lots of things and yeah. triggers that make people with IBD worry and stop them mm -hmm. travelling and it's really important to say so we're not just talking about long haul flights and far flung travel, we're talking about people just travelling in Europe mm -hmm. or even just travelling in the UK. Um, so let's start with the planning. If, if we're saying there are some very clear messages about what you should think about and plan about in advance of your travel, what would you think the most important ones are? I, mean, I think the first one is actually plan in advance. Okay. <laughs> um, that's the main thing. Uh, obviously it depends on where you're going. If you're travelling the, around the UK, then obviously not as much tra planning as if you need to be going abroad somewhere. Yeah. Um, also, it depends on your travel destination, your situation, how well you are, what medication you're taking. And they're all things that you need to think about. So when you're making a decision about what, what your holiday is going yeah. to be, what you think about, how well am I now? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. One of the things we know is that people really worry that in the period before the holiday or during the holiday they're going to have a flare and that's completely unplannable for, isn't it? It is. Is there, is there anything they can do to mitigate that, to get around that? I mean, I, I suppose always trying to travel when you're well, okay. although I know it's not possible and the nature of IBD means that you might be well and a few days before your trip yeah. you might get a flare up yeah. and again there isn't really a great deal you can do about, about that situation. It's always really important to get travel insurance if you are travelling abroad um, mainly because then that will cover any eventualities where you, where you are unwell when yeah. you're abroad. Medication, always make sure you carry enough medication with you even if you're taking medications such as injectable medications or enemas, suppositories, you can still travel with those, you can still travel, go through airport security, you just need to make sure you get your prescription from the GP, carry a letter with you, and to be honest that's probably advice anyway for wherever you travel, always make sure you have a copy of your prescription, have a copy of your letter from your hospital. So, so really it's about that green bit of paper you get from the GP with your repeat prescription on it, Yeah. And also what your, some information from your IBD yeah. team about how you currently are and what your illness yes. is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in terms of the medication, can you just take a big bag of pills? Can you just anywhere, on trains, on aeroplanes, on buses, find to travel with it? Essentially, yes, you can. Right. Um, it's, again, you're best off having supporting documentation. Meaning so, like your, 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 list of your, 
your list of prescription, your letter from the hospital. It's good to carry the medication in its original packaging okay. because then it's got your name on it. Yeah. Obviously that's difficult sometimes when you've got two weeks worth of enemas that you might need to take with you. Yes. You know, but as long as you then maybe have the supporting documentation that say that says you're taking this medication, you're taking liquids. So presumably you take your medicines in you keep your medicines on you at all times, do you? You don't want it to get lost in the No, I'd say a bit of both really. Yeah. No, I'd say a bit of both really. So, so make sure you've got enough with you. Yeah, so have some in your checked luggage, okay. but have a selection in your hand luggage just in case your checked luggage goes missing. But when we get to airports then, the idea of syringes and airport security just immediately gives me a hot sweat. You know, I just think that would put me off. Can you really take injectable treatments, so things like Humira, mm -hmm. can you take Humira pens you can take, through hospital? Yep. Security? You yep, you can take your mirror pens, you can take methotrexate, you can take all, you know, every, as long as you have a letter. Okay. And not just a letter from the hospital, you can get special letters from, say if you're on Humira, you can get letters from your home care company. Okay, um, so the people that deliver yep, it to you. so the people that deliver the medication. Right. They can quite happily send you, if you contact them, a letter that's got all your details on, that is perfectly fine for airport security. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I'm not saying it's always going to be foolproof. No. But it should be. As long as you have that information, okay. it's going to make your trip through airport security or through any other security, yeah. whether, you know, in the UK, yeah. it will make it a lot more easier than if you don't have it. One of the things that the, the campaign that the charity is running is about access to toilets and travel, and particularly around big travel companies and how they do that. Presumably, there are easier ways of travelling or things that you can do to make the actual method of travel a bit easier in terms of toilet access or where you are or how you get a seat, that sort of stuff. Yeah, there is. I mean, not every mode of travel or holiday is going to suit everybody. You know, some people do prefer to have a UK holiday. It's always better to try and get an aisle seat. Right. Because yeah, then definitely. you're closer. Yeah. If you're travelling, one of the things that I've heard a lot about is people having problems if you know there's kind of one toilet, either whether that's on a train or more specifically when it's an issue on an, on an aeroplane, yeah. where you've got one toilet and there's a mass stampede after dinner for everyone to use that toilet, and you know people aren't always understanding whether you've got a bowel condition, yeah. and I suppose that's where if things like the can't wait card yeah. can come in handy. Oh, excellent. Which Plus. is yeah. So the can't wait card is really handy um, because it's available in different languages. Oh, so is when, it? Yep. So when you are travelling overseas, you can have it in different languages. Yeah. It can be used when you're at your destination, but it can all be also be used in the UK as well if you're travelling there. You know, it's, an, it's sometimes an easier way to show that than to then have to explain to somebody, yeah. especially somebody who maybe works in the travel industry at a train station or at an airport. So here are something. our plugs. If you are a member of Planes of Flights UK, so worth re joining up, you get the Can't Wait card, which is, a, I don't know, that's available mm -hmm. in other languages. Can't Wait card, which you can show to access toilets. You get a radar key, which is great in the UK, so that gives you access to those locked disabled toilets. And Mitesh in Coms told me to say 7,000 across the UK, so really useful. You get our um, Connect magazine, which has loads of information in it, but also the ability for you to share. And people talk about travel quite a lot, don't they, in here. And also there's some really good patient information, which accompanies and goes well with IBD passports. Um, so we've got uh, information on um, travel insurance, or insurance generally, but a section with travel, and also talking about all the things we're talking about today. So that's our plug done. Yeah. One of the things that you've got on IBD Passport is about talking about an emergency travel kit. Yeah. What's in your emergency <laughs> travel kit? <laughs> so it's, it's all about being prepared, really, and being prepared for all eventualities. So it is what maybe a lot of people would also carry when they're out and about. So making sure that you've got, you know, spare underwear, right. sanitary products, okay. um, air fresheners, particular ones that you can get that are quite good for masking things because, you know, it's, it can be quite embarrassing sometimes, especially in confined toilets that are quite often on 
any sorts of modes of transport. Um, also looking at medication. So taking an adequate supply of your regular medication, mm -hmm. but also thinking about issues that could happen when you're abroad and maybe you can't get access to a GP. So a lot of times people might be more prone to getting travel's diarrhoea. And that's not just because of the destination, it's maybe the changing diet and just the situation that people are in. So it's always handy to take an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin, which most GPs, but all IBD units, should be able to prescribe at least a few days' worth okay. for people to be able to take if they do get diarrhoea. Things that help with diarrhoea again, like Imodium. Yeah, the stuff that slows yeah, you down. Yeah, that can sometimes help. Taking in small doses, it's safe in IBD. Sometimes on packets of Imodium, yeah. on the information it says you shouldn't take yeah. it if you've got IBD though. I know, and I think that is mainly because sometimes people can take it and mask symptoms of a flare. So sometimes people may take Imodium to prevent diarrhoea that maybe isn't caused by... You know, like not a flare. Okay, so, so yeah. what you mean is, yeah. is that people avoid going to the doctor and or getting medical advice and yeah. just mask their symptoms yeah. by taking yeah, just taking them just to get around day to day. But to life. use it for a short time on a holiday yeah. or to use it when and if yeah. if you're going on a long journey, that's okay. Yes. Um, things like rehydration salts. Um, right. Again, I know they're all based around you know symptoms such as diarrhea, but that that is the main kind of thing really. Obviously, if if people have got a stoma. Yeah, it's always good to take extra stoma supplies um, and additional things such as just as that that they might not be able to easily get access to when they're travelling abroad. Okay. So anything like that, I mean, anything really that you would need at home, you can take in an emergency kit when you're abroad. Okay, really. But then so, a few extra things. For okay. So it's really about thinking in advance, yeah. planning what those things yeah. are, making sure you've got a good stock of everything. Go to IBD Passport yeah. and read what yeah. it says. I mean, there is there is a list, a, a comprehensive list of things that we suggest, both on actually Crohn's and Colitis UK yeah. and on IBD Passport. It's also good just to speak to your IBD team. You know, speak to the IBD nurse, doctors, go and see a travel clinic because they might be able to suggest things that you haven't thought about that you might need in your kit, depending on the destination that you're going to. So that brings us on really because some people, quite rightly, want a really proper travel yeah. and they are travelling for long periods of time, perhaps to out of way more exotic places, places that require vaccinations, for example. Um, and how do you find a travel clinic? How do you know that they're giving you the right advice? And how do you make that link between your IBD specialist, whether that's your consultant or nurse specialist, and the travel clinic to make sure your information is correct? I think the information should come from all different areas, really. So travel clinics, a lot of GPs have travel clinics. Right. Some hospitals have travel clinics. There are a lot of private travel clinics as well around. Um, it, it's, it depends really on, on what you want. Obviously the GP travel clinics, they will be free, usually run by nurses. Um, the private ones, usually the consultations aren't that much. And travel clinic consultations are mostly focused around vaccinations? Are they everything? Oh, okay. No, I mean, a lot of it is vaccinations, but yeah. it's about general travel health. Okay. About what your destination is. And, and quite often they'll go through your itinerary, right. they'll help you plan your itinerary. Obviously, you know, they'll have some knowledge about chronic diseases, but that's when the IBD team comes in. Okay. Because from an IBD point of view, we'll be able to give a lot of information about IBD and how to manage your IBD and, and things that you might need to consider. But then we might refer to travel clinics for more travel-specific things. Yeah. So I think the, there needs to be a merge, really, in information from both okay. and there's no reason why you can't get a bit of information from your GP or travel clinic yeah. and a bit of information and we can talk to each other as well. And so if you're having the, the issue about vaccinations that a lot of people uh, with IBD are taking immunosuppressant yeah. treatment, so treatment that already is suppressing their immune system a little bit, what implications does that have if you need to have vaccinations? I mean, it has quite a lot of implication, really. So medications such as azathioprine, mercaptopurine, infliximab, Humira, all those medications, they do suppress your immune system and they will affect vaccinations. So as a general rule, it is best to have all your vaccinations before you start these medications. Oh, gosh. That's serious, that's yeah. serious planning. Yeah, yeah that is. Obviously, that's not possible in a lot no. of time. Sure. So, yeah, sure. you know... 
the, the, the consensus and the general rule is that if you are taking an immunosuppressant medication and you need to have a live vaccine, so that is a vaccination where basically there's a lot of the active thing, illness. illness in it. Okay. So it's a tiny, tiny dose that yeah. you give. If you're on an immunosuppressant, you can't have that sort of vaccination. So that is things such as um, yellow fever. Right. An example is like the chickenpox vaccination, the varicella, which is, to be honest, not used in travel, it's more used in, in childhood. But things such as that typhoid, okay. things such as that you can't have as a, as a live vaccine. So let's take a step back. Yeah. So if you're a mega traveller just generally in life, and you've got IBD, always keep in mind that it, when you're having conversations about new medicines, yeah. you let your IBD team yes. know yeah. that you're a mega traveller. Yes. Because there may be decisions about treatments, if you plan really in advance, yeah. that you may, you may decide to get vaccinations in advance of starting yes. immuno treatments. Is that right? That is. Yeah, because usually if you're taking an immunosuppressant medication, yes. and then you need to have a live vaccine, you'll need to be off that medication for anything between three and six months. Oh gosh. So if you're on, and we're talking things like azathioprine, yeah. captopurin, yeah. methotrexate, yeah. Humira, adalimumab, That's infliximab, infliximab as well. Infliximab, yeah. So if you're on those and you need to have a live vaccine, you have to stop them for between three and six months. Yes. Okay. So coming back to our top line, which is... IBD patient people with IBD should be able to travel anywhere. Yeah. That that could be that could be a real stopper, couldn't it? So if you're on azathioprine and you want to go somewhere where you need live vaccines, what do you do? Again, it's about planning in advance. So I think sometimes you do have to be a bit realistic. Okay. So not every trip and every itinerary is going to be possible. And I get a lot of questions via IBD passport with people saying that they are on this kind of treatment, they're on immunosuppressant, especially more the biologics, that they're feeling the best that they have in a long time. Yes, they've really gotten better. Yeah, that they want to go yeah. on a gap year abroad, or they've got an amazing opportunity to go teaching abroad, or yeah. to go you know, on, on a different trip. And, and they want advice because they're taking this medication that they have to either come into hospital for an infusion every eight weeks or they have to inject themselves and they have to get a delivery of the medication. Yeah. And sometimes, depending on the destination, it can be done. Right. And you can sort out the logistics of getting that medication in that country. Sometimes you can't. Okay. And so it's then a decision about what you do. Yeah. You know, do you alter your itinerary? Do you change, change stop the, the medication. medication? Stop it because you feel yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. And take that. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, yes. So that's all very individual. Yeah, it feels very and individual. It, it feels like that conversation with, with your IBD team in those situations yeah. is really important. And the earlier the better, especially if you're taking that sort of medication. Okay. If you're taking medication such such as things that need like injectables or things that need a delivery or things where you need hospital admission. Okay. Can you do that? Can you travel and get a French hospital to give it to you? In your for example. Yeah. No, you can actually. Oh, can you? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> how, how would you go about that? So yeah, off I go to France for a gap year. Yeah. So it's within the UK we have what's called a reciprocal agreement. Right. So we've got agreements with certain countries obviously most of them within Europe, and also ones that you wouldn't expect outside Europe, such as Australia, okay. New Zealand, okay. um, a lot of other places as well, yeah. um, such as, I think, Afghanistan's in there. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. You want to holiday in Kabul? <laughs> yeah. Actually, there's a list. If you go on, again, plug in the IBD Passport website. <laughs> no, 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 that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, if yeah. you go on the IBD Passport website, um, on the Travel with IBD page, if you look on the travel overseas, yeah. there's a list of countries that the UK has got reciprocal healthcare agreements with. So those countries with reciprocal healthcare agreements, as long as you know how to find them, yeah. they will offer you yeah. free Yeah. So it's healthcare. either free yes. or significantly reduced. Okay. You basically get um, the same healthcare as what a person who is in that country 
you get. So part of your planning and your choosing of destination may be saying, I know that I'm going to be away six months, I want to see a gastroenterologist a couple of times or have access to one, I'm going to look for a country with a reciprocal agreement and then try and find out if there's a service locally there that I can use. Yeah, and that's where the IBD network section of IBD Passport comes in. Right. So that is a section on the website where any IBD centres that have registered with the website, you can find them. So at the moment there's um, over 400 IBD centres from across the world, right. including China, America, Australia. Oh, okay, so you can actually look for places and know how so to you contact the gastroenterology so if, if there. So if you're travelling, anybody that's registered, any healthcare professionals that have registered with the site, their hospital will feature on there and it'll have contact details. A lot of them will have pictures so you can see the centre right. and it'll have information on what sort of services they offer yeah. as well. We have to talk a little bit about travel insurance because one of the things that came up from the survey was that quite a number of people just don't get travel insurance when they've got IBD to travel because of the problems of getting it. Um, what advice can we give or what advice is there out there about insurance and IBD when you're travelling? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true exactly what you say because um, it's the research that we said just shows that people don't, and I think a lot of the time it is because many people don't realise they have to get it. Okay, so the message number one is, is you, you really you, need it. If you're travelling abroad, outside of the UK, you do really need to have travel insurance that covers your IBD. Okay. You need to tell them that you have IBD because if you do become unwell, then it, you won't be covered. And what are the things that are the common things that stop you getting travel insurance when you go yeah. start being that honest with them? It's the premiums. Everything that I hear is that the premium from insurance companies differ so much right. all over the place. And, you know, I've, I've spoke to a lot of people about insurance and that's the one thing that they all say. And it's based on the risk assessment of that particular insurance company. It's always good to shop around. Um, some companies will charge less than others. Yeah. An interesting thing that has come up actually on the Facebook page and on Twitter recently is that the insurance companies have started to add a new question in about whether you are on an injectable or a, an intravenous medication for your IBD. Right. And it, if people click yes, so like infliximab, Humira, I guess it would even be methotrexate. Then the premium goes up. Quite significantly okay. is what people are saying. And I'm presuming that's because the insurer's risk assessment is that that person will have a more severe yeah. disease because they're on it. But then it's counterproductive because that person's actually probably the wellest they have been for a long time. But the key thing is to shop around. And, and again, coming back to yeah. our information, so the insurance with the IBD has got a list of insurance companies at the back um, for you to shop around with. But I think from the charities end, we'd really like to hear experience of, of health insurance because it seems to be a bigger problem that's developing. So if there are things you want to comment, let us know. Then uh, just comment through the Facebook now. I think the Facebook forum especially is really good for that because I yeah. see a lot of people asking questions and pe other people who use the Facebook forum, Crohn's and Colitis UK Facebook forum, I see often them saying, oh I've used this insurer and that one. Yeah. And what I find quite surprising is quite a lot of times the insurance that credit cards the banks provide as yeah. part of their services, they seem to be quite good. Oh, okay. But they seem to include IBD okay. without charging the earth. Yeah. But again, it's on a very individual basis. It depends on how well you are, whether you've had any recent hospital admissions, what other medical conditions you have, okay. because then that can increase okay. your premium. So the message is, be honest, be open, shop around, yeah. and let us know your problems. We'd really like yeah, to hear about it. definitely. Them. Right, should we do some questions? Yeah. We've got some questions. I want to look over here. Huh? Lynn. Lynn wants to know, she's travelling to Greece, how does she get her medicines through customs? Okay, again, it depends what medication you're taking, Lynn. It's, um, again, the main thing is, as I've said to Isabel, is get a copy of your prescription from the GP, which is the little green thing that you get whenever you get a repeat prescription before you cash it into the pharmacy. Get a letter from your doc from your doctor, from your IBD team, 
that explains your medical condition, the medications you're on, and gives a brief history about what you're taking. If you are taking any injectable medications, that's not a problem at all. Contact the home care team, so the people that deliver your medication. So that's carrying on because Sandra's asking about taking Humira. Yeah. If that's what you yeah. mean. So that's Humira. Yeah. Humira. So go yeah. to the healthcare at home yeah. or the, the company that delivers your yeah. Humira to you yeah. and say that you're travelling and yeah. they'll help. And it? they will help. They can often deliver a cool wallet. So it's Clever. a yeah. So it's a little thing. Like a little fridge, yeah. It cool. is. It's like a little fridge that's got um well not fridge, but yeah, it's like a little cool wallet that's got um, ice packs in. And you can take that with you in your hand luggage. You can, it's also good actually to let the airlines know. So if you are taking any injectable medications that are actually going to be in your hand luggage, okay. let the airline know because they'll then let you store them quite often. So, so Misha's asking, she clearly isn't completely comfortable with the message. Can she definitely take pills in her hand luggage? Yes. Okay, definitely, but, definitely. but if you're taking injectables, what do you do? Write to the airline in advance, email them? Yeah, what, I mean, what's the best I think thing? it's just to cover all bases. Okay. As a general rule, having your prescription, yeah. a letter from your IBD team, in addition to a letter from your home care team, if yeah. you have got an injectable like Humira, should be enough. Okay. Because then you've got it all there okay. and you can show them. Okay. It's it's a double, part double. of this is confidence, isn't it? You know, it's like I said at the beginning, the idea of taking pens of humira that gives me a hot sweat and I don't use it. But, you know, you hear that, you know, that, that's the biggest thing. It's about having the confidence, grazing it out, saying, here I am, this is a medication, there's nothing wrong with me bringing this. Yeah. Having the right documentation and just going for it, is yeah. it? And there should be no reason why you don't get, you know, yeah. they might ask questions, but if you've got the documentation and you can show that... This is what you know. This is what you have, and this is why you've got it. Yeah. The medication with you. And be confident in that. Don't yes. let it put you off. No, Brilliant. definitely not. There should be Don't no reason why not. Okay. Okay. So Tuffy, Michael's now saying he wants to take scissors um, on a plane for managing his stoma. Okay. Now, so that's more difficult with security these days. Isn't it, it is. I mean. Probably the best advice, and the stoma companies are excellent with this. Right. So most of the stoma companies do have, obviously, good stoma nurse support, but they also have websites that have got vast amounts of information about travelling with IBD. Right. These travelling with a stoma. Sorry, sorry travelling with stoma. Sorry. Okay. And these are actually on, again, on the IBD Passport website, but you can ask your stoma company as well. The key ones that we mention on the IBD Passport website, just because the information is readily available, is Danzac and Coloplast. Okay. And they have got a kind of a, a stoma passport, they call it. Right. That's got information. There's absolutely reams of stuff you can download. Okay. That's got supporting letters, supporting information. What they advise, actually is to cut the stoma barriers in advance. In advance. Okay. So that, so and that makes sense. I mean I suppose if you're going on a yeah. really long haul flight you might need a few of them. But well, you're you right. It's to get the flanges yeah. cut in advance and then you haven't got to have yeah. the scissors. So to get your flanges cut in advance and then yeah. you shouldn't need scissors on the plane. Yeah. You can pack your scissors in the checked luggage yeah. that goes in the hold. Yeah. But just make sure you cut the flanges, have enough supplies with you. For the duration of yep. the flight. And liquids are fine, again, get a covering letter to say why you've got liquids. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. Yep. And even liquids over 100 mil. Yeah. So people, again, which is, you know, we've not covered this yet, but people on elemental diets. Okay, no, that's a question, actually. Oh, yeah, is I'll it? it oh, okay. Yeah. Thomas, do you need to pay <laughs> extra baggage allowance um, if you're taking medication or other medical equipment on a plane? No. So it is? Yeah. So a lot of the time, okay. if you contact the airline... Even the cheaper, more bucket airlines? I mean, potentially. <laughs> okay. okay. Because it's a medical condition. Okay. So if you ask them in advance, then they would. And again, this is all covered. So, so let's take elemental diet yeah. as an example. So you're somebody who uses elemental diet either all the time or during flares and you've got large amounts of liquid drinks you need to take. What you would... Work out how much you need, work out how much luggage you need, and then let the airline know in advance. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you would, and then you'd be able to take so much with you on the plane, and then the rest is checked. And you do usually get extra baggage allowance. Okay. 
even with kind of more the budget airlines where you think you might not. Quite often they can be quite generous. Gosh, they're good travellers, this bunch. They're all going long <laughs> ways. Sonia says, can she take malaria tablets? Uh, yep, so that's a good question. You can. Right. Again, you've got to be cautious. It's best to see a travel clinic because the kind of malaria tablet you need depends on your destination. Um, the most common ones that you can have, which is prescribed a lot, is doxycycline. Doxycycline, one of the side effects is that it can make you more sensitive to the sun. Uh, we haven't so, talked about sunscreen, actually. So it's more important. It's important anyway. So you need to cover up with sunscreen. A high factor, both UVA and UVB, high protection. Okay. Because then that'll protect you quite a lot. Um, if you're taking medications such as azathioprine and mecaptopurin. This Obviously, is the malaria tablets or sunscreen. Just a general rule. So a general, general rule. Okay. Having a pure in because there is a risk of skin problems when you're taking that sort of medication. Okay. Increase. You, know, very you really slight. need to be generous. You with need the to sunscreen. be very generous. Okay. So yeah, more caution if you are taking malaria tablets, especially with applying sunscreen. And um, the malaria tablets, such as doxycycline, yeah. it can cause a bit of stomach upset. Okay, because they're light antibiotics. Yeah. Okay. So an alternative to doxycycline is one called malarone. Malarone isn't available on the NHS, so you would have to buy that. And if you're having a prolonged trip, it can be a bit pricey, but it has less side effects than what doxycycline does. But the key thing is speak to your travel clinic, okay. because your travel health clinic and your travel nurse can really advise They'll you. They understand the side They can effects. advise you perfectly on that. Okay. Yeah. I've got a comment now. Maria says... She got badly sunburned. Slap, slap, slap. <laughs> <laughs> I can say that to you sometimes. Yeah. Kate's a great traveller. <laughs> I do. Um, I sun. <laughs> <laughs> Emma says, can she get a can't wait card for other countries? Yep, you just contact Crohn's and Colitis UK and they're available. I'm not sure exactly what languages they are available in, but if you contact the advice line, um, they can get one. Yeah, information advice down here, yeah. which actually is open for any questions or queries you have, not particularly around travel. Um, it's open, the opening hours are on the website. It's really a good way of just getting more information. Mm -hmm. Kay, one of the things we've not talked about is traveller's diarrhoea. Because I can imagine, you know, anywhere you go, with a whether you're travelling in the UK or you're travelling short haul, long haul, all of our guts change a bit when we travel, whether that's about diet, water, whatever, that change of environment. It's difficult though, isn't it, to know, is this just a normal change? Is this something infectious I should worry about? Is this my IBD flowing? What messages are it important, first of all, to tell the difference and prevent things from happening? Okay, so to tell, a lot of, a lot of people um, will generally know what their traditional IBD symptoms are, so what they usually get as part of a flare. Yeah. As a general rule, if you have got any sort of infectious diarrhoea, the main symptom that you will get is bloating. It will be a sudden onset of diarrhoea. So literally, literally oh my god, here it is arrived. I've yeah, got to, okay. Usually associated with bloating. It will happen within the space of hours or 24 hours. Okay. You'll go from being normal to... Like, so a bit different to sometimes when relapses of IBD, it just over a few days yeah. you start feeling worse. It'll this be is just usually like jump 24 it hours. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that is, I mean, obviously that's not for everybody, but as a general rule, that is, that is what happens. Yeah. And you'll get explosive diarrhoea that is different to what you would normally get. And, and what can you do? What are the sensible things to do just to try and avoid wherever you're travelling yeah. to um, picking something up? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the general advice that anybody who doesn't have IBD would be given. So try and drink bottled water wherever possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, avoid icing your drinks unless you know for a fact it's come from a sealed bag and not from water. Um, peel fruit. Avoid the salad bar. Yeah. Make sure meats are well cooked. Okay. Avoid street food, as tempting as it is, if you're backpacking yeah. abroad and having fun. Yeah. You know, and you're wanting to try a locust. <laughs> that you know. Yeah. Not, not really good idea. <laughs> no, <maybe> okay. <laughs> okay. No locust. No, you know that that kind of thing. Yes. Really. Um, you know. And then and then coming back to your emergency travel kit, have some diarrhea salts and. Yeah. A and some antibiotics, some rehydration, yeah. rehydration, and for what ifs. For what ifs, maybe you know, 
try and get to see a travel clinic. It's important to exclude any sort, if you can, if it's possible, right. you know, to give a sample, to try and exclude any bugs, to try and get advice. Okay. Even the far from places that you might travel to have travel clinics where actually it'll be really cheap and easy to get advice. Okay. Um, they're the main things really. And if you do have medications in your tr emergency travel kit, you can take some ciprofloxacin, which is the antibiotic that yeah. you would give, yeah. to see whether that will resolve symptoms. And usually it will resolve symptoms in 24, 48 hours and just, just get you feeling better. But if it also, I mean, usually as well, anybody who's travelling, if you have got an IBD nurse, you can always email. Yeah. It's one of and the biggest, can, yeah. I mean, at, at running a service, isn't it? Yeah. It's one of the biggest things we get at people abroad who actually contact the nursing yeah. service from abroad saying this has happened. Yeah. And sometimes that's because the healthcare professionals they've seen when they've been abroad aren't IBD specialists yes, and exactly. they want reassurance as much as the poor person that's travelling. Yes, definitely. Richard says he feels anxious when he's travelling. Anything he can have or take or do to reduce that worry? I mean, I think it's interesting, one of the things, that really big things that comes out, and you really give it over strongly, is it's about being confident, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's about realising that all of this is doable, and not being frightened of it and stepping up to it a little bit, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I suppose as well, it's key that it's, we know we're not just talking about travel abroad as well. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know whether, yeah, Richard, I don't know whether you're talking about just travel anywhere, yeah. whether it could be travelling to work on the train. Yeah or travelling on the train, or travelling when you're going out for a day out, or shopping, or yeah. taking the kids out, you yeah. know, things like that. People often often do get anxious. And it's easy to get anxious, especially if maybe you have had problems when you've been travelling. And, and or previous bad experiences. Or previous bad experiences, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. And I suppose that is where things like taking the odd emoji uh, may help. Okay mainly to try and... And would that be, so let's talk about, let's say, the anxiety about about travelling here. Yeah. What do you do? Get up in the morning and take an emoji first before you have problems? Do you try and prevent that or do you just take it once you're starting to have problems? I mean, I think if you, if you have had problems in the past and, and it is something that then makes you anxious because you're thinking that you're going to experience the same thing again when you go when you're out and about. Yeah. Then taking the Odimodium okay. can help. Okay. To do that, um, obviously, kind of planning for where toilet facilities are, but it's it's not always easy. And there's a message which is always talk to your IBD team about it. You know, often these yeah. are things we don't want to bother the doctor yeah. with, but actually they're really influencing life. And actually, a conversation with your specialist really may help. With some very sensible, easy, straightforward yeah. things. And I think that's a really good point, actually. I think that, you know, whenever you go into your IBD consultation, it's good to maybe take a, a list of things that you want to discuss, even things that may not be, you know, the key things. You know, you're discussing your health, obviously, but other things that might be affecting your quality of life and that might be affecting your day-to-day. -day. Yeah. It's good to bring that up because people are interested and people do want to know. Yeah, absolutely. And quite often there is an easy solution or at least guidance and advice that people can give you that if you hadn't have raised it, wouldn't. wouldn't but be also there. it gives your IBD team much more of a message about how much, how influential your IBD is on your quality of yeah, life definitely. and what are the things that are important to you to get to. And, and that's really important that they hear that. They yeah. want to hear, we want yeah, to hear that. Definitely we? we do, really, yeah. Um, Sharon says she's going to Australia and she's worried about how to manage urgency on the plane. Okay. So you talked about aisle seats. Yeah. So aisle seats are a good one yeah. because then you can access the toilets easily. There's that awful bit where you have to sit with your seatbelt on. Yes. It's always good. I mean, you can actually use the toilet quite right up until the point where, where you take off, you know, the taxi in. It might be good just to have a quick word with the air stewards. Literally as you're boarding, yeah, just quietly and just say so. to them, okay. you know, you can either show them can't wait card or just say, look, you know, I've got a bowel condition. Yeah. It, it means that I'm, I might need the toilet and, and it's quite unpredictable, especially if you know that you're penned in. Yeah, well, exactly. Somehow and, that makes it and worse. And it does. It can sometimes make it that I need to go to the toilet or I can't go to the toilet. Yeah. 
you know, so if you know that actually, if you do need to quickly rush there, that you can. Yeah. Um, I guess avoid big meals before you fly. Okay. Keep yourself hydrated. Make sure that you've got plenty. Because the flying itself can dehydrate you quite a lot, yeah. just with the cabin pressure in the air. So just do that. But you know, maybe do that. Just avoid heavy meals, and that's one of the reasons why on planes they do the light food. You know, you never have any big meals, and maybe do that 24 hours before, just to give your bowel a bit of a rest, and just to make sure you haven't got anything stodgy in there. That's yeah, are there any big issues around altitude and IBD, or altitude yeah, and bowels? There is. I mean, there is. There's been one study that's been done, so there's limited research, but there is evidence to show that altitude can affect IBD, right. and that people either flying or travelling to areas of altitude for a prolonged period. So, say you're climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, Kilimanjaro the <laughs> treks to Peru. Yes. Okay, that yeah. kind of thing. And actually, uh, it was interesting because I saw a woman in clinic only this week, and she had a pro she had the same problem. So completely well, leading up to her flight, went to Australia. Yeah. While she was in Australia, she had a few symptoms, and during her trip to Australia, it involved flying around quite a few different places. Yeah. So during the after shortly after the flight, she had a few symptoms. In between times, she was absolutely fine. Yeah. And so for her, obviously, you know, it might have been the anxiety, but she did have a sensitivity, whereas other people wouldn't be affected. But it also it also comes back to the conversation about planning your medication, yeah. that you know what to do with your medication when you get a flare. And most most of, most people do know yeah. that now, don't they? That up, up the dose of that or start the NMO or whatever it is, and that you've got enough with you to be able to do that. Yeah. And if you don't know have a plan so you know some places don't have IBD nurses um, some people might not be able to get hold of information readily so I'd say maybe have an appointment with either your GP or with your IBD team before you go traveling and maybe just have a written plan of okay if I flare what should I do yeah. can I increase my medication how should I do it yeah. just in case yeah. you, you don't know because of course not well, but, but that's a sensible plan to have just generally yeah. if you live with really. IBD it's one of those conversations yeah. that your IBD team should be having with you yeah. Yeah. that you that you know what to do when things aren't as good as they should be yeah. um, because that's that's what we want we want yeah. people to be able to start treating themselves yeah. without having to come and wait for us or get through to us or it's not to say yeah. that we're not there but you know we want people to feel empowered to do it no. themselves don't no, we? that's true definitely yeah, yeah. yeah. Last question. I don't know if I know the answer to this one, so we might. Kate says, "Can we use radar keys abroad?" I think they're UK. I think they're UK, but I can find out and I'll post on the Facebook group. Excellent. There you oh, go. Well, I'll find out for you. Watch this space. There's a reason yeah, to keep an eye on it. I will. I'll post on the Facebook forum. Actually, or I can post on the um, yeah on this live chat with a feed there. Okay, that's fantastic. That's all your questions. Brilliant. I hope that's been useful and I hope also that you've been commenting, particularly about insurance, if there's things that you want to tell us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I hope it's been helpful and um, we'll have another one again soon, I think. And if anyone's got any questions, I mean, I'll, I'll try and have a look on the, um, on the Facebook Live thing and I'll answer any questions that anybody's got. But feel free to ask anything via the IBD Passport website as well. I'm always here. You'll be inundated. <laughs> I don't mind. Thank you all. <laughs>